Welcome once again on the Metal Voice, uh, you know, returning guest, excellent singer, one of my favorite singers, Tony Martin. How are you doing, Tony? Hi, bud. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I'm pleased to finally announce, and I'm sure you are too, right? The long-awaited Ono Domini, which means in the year of our Lord, I think. Yeah. Is that correct? The Something box. Like set the tony martin years on black sabbath this is a long time coming yeah <laughs> so let, let's just start right at the beginning explain to me i know that you've wanted this forever right and the fans yeah. have wanted this forever but explain to me the phone rings it's tony iomi hey tony let's do this like, just explain to me go back on those steps there um actually um uh, you're right. I have been wanting this for a long time, um, just as you have and the fans have. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in the band, so I have no part in the decision making or the the, mm -hmm. um, the politics that go on. Um, yep. So I had to kind of sit and twiddle my thumbs just like you all did. Um, and so I didn't have any role to play in it. It was just that, you know they'd sort of said they were thinking about it some years ago, but because of all the band politics and the contracts and the amount of people that are involved that they have to get agreements from, um, they, about a year ago, they called me and said, we can't do it. It's just, there's just, it's too complicated. There's too many people, you know, demanding this, that, and the other, and we just can't get it together. So then, uh, a, a few months after that, they, um, called me again and said, do you know what? Things have changed. And so we think we're going to get this thing going after all. And BMG, the record label, picked it up. And um, they've been so patient and uh, they ran with it. So it sort of started to happen really quite quickly after that. Um, the um, um, remix of Forbidden uh, Tony did with these engineers. I had no role to play in that either. Mm -hmm. um, but they've done a great job. And then he invited me to come down and listen to it some months ago. Yeah. And I was just blown away. So once they'd got over the initial uh, problems mm -hmm. of uh, contracts and agreements and, you know, band politics and all the rest of the crap that goes on, um, it, it kind of happened quite quickly. And here we are now with the whole box set thing in, in your hand. And wow, it's a thing. Eh? <laughs> Finally. I don't know how long it's been. Jeez. I so, I mean, but go back to what was your feeling when Tony finally said to you, we're doing this? Um, really pleased, obviously, because, you know, it, it was like 10 years of my life, 10 years of the Sabbath story that was missing. Uh, well, it was missing in the physical sense. It, it wasn't missing in the fans' minds. Uh, uh, people remembered it. And, you know, over the past 25 years, people have always talked to me about it, but they just couldn't buy it. So although, you know, people knew about it, they just couldn't get their hands on it. And I might as might say just that neither could I. Um, I. It's the first time I've actually physically held these albums in my hand in like 25 years because I gave all mine away <laughs> thinking that I would get some more. And then I, I they stopped making it and I couldn't. So, it, you know, actually to physically hold them myself is great as well. Um, really pleased. Was, I, I, I should say they're released in North America. They're under Rhino and in Europe they're under BMG. So okay, I believe yeah, cool. that, 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 that is a distribution or how it's working out from the label you're perspective. Yeah, you are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so people can get them on both sides of the, uh, the pond, we'll say, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, back in the day, when I was a young kid and you were on stage playing, were people, I, I should say the statement, people were less, exp less, um, what's the right word? Go on, spit it out. <laughs> they they felt that whenever bands would change members, they they it upset them more. Yeah. However, today, however, today we're seeing bands change members like I change my socks, and people accept it a lot more. So I guess people were less accepting of change back in the day. However, today people are more accepting of moving parts in bands and, 
And do you think that is the point of why your popularity with Black Sabbath has sort of skyrocketed in the recent, I guess, the last decade? I think you're right. In some respects, there is an, an element of that. The, I've noticed from my kids that they're not so attached to, you know, particular band members, and but even though they still revere the original lineup. Um, but there is another thing in play here in that we, back then, we were just a little bit unfashionable. And um, we were coming up to the days of Nirvana and, you know, Green Day and, you know, Nine Inch Nails and garage bands and grunge and stuff like that. So they were starting to steal the limelight a little bit. And we were just a little bit out of out of fashion. But what's happened now is with all that dust settled, um, people are revisiting these, you know, albums and also there's something else to play in here in that it's been 25 years. So there's a whole generation of people that never even, you know, got it before. So um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is, has come into play, which culminates in like what we're doing now. And, and that re box set, that re-release of the box set just fills that gap. Suddenly, not only that it's got, um, it's been validated now by Tony Iommi, who's really loving what we did. And uh, it, it never had that before. So now he's sort of saying, what a great job we've done. And actually that the songs and the, the, the stuff that we'd written was really good. You know, not that we doubted it really. It's just that when you listen to it now, it's just like, wow. And he said to me, well, I went down his house to his studio and he said to me, I don't know how you sang on that stuff. I said, no, I don't know. <laughs> I sang on that stuff either. <laughs> it was fucking hard work, mate. <laughs> I, I had the I had the pleasure of listening to the remix of Forbidden and the rem. I, I heard the whole box set uh, as it is today, and I was kind of trying to compare it to what we could hear online or with the albums that I have. And it it is a very and we maybe we could touch on this Forbidden, for example, the last album that you yeah. were on. There, it, it does sound a lot better the guitars are up more front the guitar the drums are more present yeah. and it just sounds cleaner like it was recorded yesterday indeed and, and it's much it really fits as a black sabbath album now um i really wish cozy pal was alive to hear this because i think he would have just loved it because we didn't like back then you know and um I think he would have just been thrilled, as I am, you know, to to hear it. They've done a real good job of it. That not just forbidden; they sort of remastered the others as well, um, which gives them a better sound. And you're right, uh, forbidden is more guitar based and slightly less keyboard based. Um, with the the drums are thundering away now, so you know, that's great. I, I just love it now. I didn't back then, but I do now. Actually, that was my next question. Uh, what would you have changed about Forbidden? Was is it just simply the remix, or you would have maybe played around with the song structures? Back back then, you mean, or back right then, now? Back then, yeah, yeah. Back oh, then. Oh no, back then everything. <laughs> um, I I actually would have liked to have revisited it personally, because um, there's just a couple of songs which I just feel like, ah oh, man, could have just. If you'd have concentrated just a little bit more, you could have got nailed it, you know, better. We weren't allowed to do that. Um, and I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. Um, but uh, in general, yes. I, I mean, everything that they've done now is how you would have wanted it to have sounded back then. Um, having said that, there are people out there that love Forbidden as it was. I don't get it. I, I, me personally, I don't understand it. But honestly, you know, they, people come up to me and say, "What's wrong with it?" You know, I go, um, <laughs> you know. Where, I, I where think do I start? maybe because what you expected was different. The expectation right. was different, right? You're well, singing your ass off on all of these albums. All these albums, you're singing your ass off. Like when I listen to the, you. I listen to the whole set. I go, man, this, and I think the same way Tony Iommi said, man, you sang and friggin' high too, man. And just in pitch, oh, no, it's, it's, it's just insane, man. Insane vocals. It you know, what, one, too much, yeah. I, I'm sure it's really hard to reproduce live too. <laughs> yeah. 
what, what, I, when I listen to Forbidden, I go, this might be Forbidden, and I believe that they're companion albums in a way, Forbidden and uh, Cross Purposes, because they're the closer to Sabbath's sound in some ways, not in all ways, but it, mm. like the riffage. And, you know, like if you take a song like uh, Can't Get Close Enough, you hear that, you could, you could hear Ozzy singing that song. Or if right. you take a song right. like Shaking Off the Chains, you know, you know what, you could hear Dio singing that song. So mm. I think it's closer to sort of, not the whole album, but just there's a lot of parts of it that you can hear the classic riffage of Sabbath and the thunderous drumming of, let's say, Bill Ward-ish, which is yeah. Cozy's interpretation. Also, uh, the, on, on top of that, he, the Forbidden was the last album that I worked on. So by that time, I was already like eight years of singing um, the other singer's songs. You know, I'd, I'd been on the road several times, done several world tours, and have been singing Aussie songs and Dio songs. So it, it doesn't surprise me if, if that sort of sound creeps in because that's how you start to write, you know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really like it now. And, and um, even... Even the um, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, balance of power with iced tea on it. Now that even sounds correct now, you know, with iced tea on it. You know why? Because we've sort of come full circle, not come full circle, but we've evolved to a point where right. there is spoken word. For example, Megadeth. He had, I think it was no, it was I, it was actually Dave Mustaine did spoken word on Ice T's Body Body Counts album. So that yeah. that's been done like today. More so, and it kind of fits in today's sort of landscape. Yeah, I, I mean they were great sense. guys. Uh, you know, the, the Ice T and the and um, Ernie C and uh, and the Body Count guys. They were nice guys. I mean, we got we had a laugh with them and everything. But it was just that what they were trying to get us to do just didn't fit, and we we didn't uh, it didn't sit well. Um, I have a I used to walk around with a video camera, and, and um, I've got this video footage of. Uh, the Ernie C telling Cozy Powell how to play drums, right? That is just the weirdest thing. When you look at it and Cozy's like standing there and he, he, you look on his face and he's thinking, you know, you do know I can play drums, right? And he's going, yeah, well, I just thought we'd try something. Different. All right, I'll give it a go sort of thing. But, um, you know, it's weirdest thing. And it didn't really fit. I, I don't think so anyway. You know what I forgot about that era that I sort of was reminded as I'm kind of doing my little bit of research is that tone in, in most interviews, not all interviews, in a lot of interviews, it's always cozy and Tony, like the big names. Did yeah. that ever make you feel, you know, guys, I should be there too, or maybe because they're big names, they should be there? Like, how did that make you feel? Um, by the time about, we got to Forbidden, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, you know, in the beginning, no. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing is, I've said this a lot recently, uh, the guys were 10 years older than me, but they had 25 years experience before me and I could never catch the fuckers up. <laughs> it's always had, it doesn't matter where along the timeline, they always had that 25 years experience on me. So, you know, when they did interviews, they would know what to say and what the history was and what they were talking about. Whereas I had to learn all that stuff. Um, the longer I was in the band, the more I learned. Um, but then I, I had to learn everything about, you know, Black Sabbath, you know, right from when I did the Eternal Idol album. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, you know, for to, you know, to sit, stand in front of Black Sabbath was a major thing. So I, I had to learn, I had to study it, and I did the best I could. Um, and it turned out good. You know, we were doing all right, really. From the newly remastered, so Forbidden is remixed. It but is. The other, but the other albums are remastered. From remastered, yeah. The box set, which album do you think should have been a lot bigger? when you look back than it was um uh, I, well okay Th there was a there was a kind of shift in what i was uh, doing i mean i started off singing about the gothic death stuff <laughs> i mean i had an interest in you know frankenstein and dracula and all that kind of thing but i was also using old english text you know like from shakespeare and Wallace and stuff like that, and Shelley. The people don't speak English like that anymore, uh, and and so I'd got old English text, the Gothic death thing, and I was putting that on top of Black Sabbath music. Well, it was working, 
you know. But I think, I think it took them by surprise a little bit. You know, the, they what's all this death? You know, suddenly. Um, and then I started think thinking about contemporary things. You know, by the time I've got to cross purposes, um, the things like the David Koresh thing, Waco, Texas, and all that thing was happening. Well, how stupid was that? But it's still about the stupidity of you know religion, where people put their faith in in things, and and that's what it was about. So, the, by the time I've got to like forbidden, I'm really like singing off the wall, and so it, it just changed along the way, you know. And uh, I, I I I can see us developing, and I can see us experimenting with like things. How how the fans were perceiving it was sometimes different because they have their favourite you know, albums and their favorite tracks and the rest of the thing. But now this changes everything because the box set now has lifted Forbidden into the same zone as, you know, Headless Cross. The sound is in the same zone as Cross Purposes. Now it's it's grown up. It's it's like become an adult. It's, you know, not a, a small album anymore. It's, it's big. So lots and lots of reasons why they're, you know, they think. So I think for... Uh, for my part, Headless Cross was the most important. Cross Purposes was the um, where we started to grow up, and Forbidden Now um, really um, is back into like being a Black Sabbath album. So for different reasons, different albums can't really say one, but uh, you know I, I think they're all in in the frame ready for it. So just like any music lover, you know, what we love changes from year to year it or does, day to day, right? Doesn't. You wake up in the morning, you say, you know what? Uh, Eternal Idol is my favorite or Tear is my favorite. Uh, so yeah. things change, you know, as music. What about Tear? Let's talk about that album. Do you find it's like, it's like a companion in a way to Headless Cross, right? It's got that same big production it kind of to me it sounds like black sabbath meets a rainbow in a sense right it's just right, it's, right, it's right. more it's, it's a bigger reverb and a lot bigger sound and a lot of space and layering uh, tell me about tear and where are you um, your thoughts on that well one? um i was still uh you know in, in the gothic death <laughs> sort of old english text stuff but i'd applied it to like this viking mythology thing I mean, in England, the Vikings were not good for us. <laughs> they came and sort of <laughs> killed killed everybody and took our women and stole the sheep. You know, so <laughs> they weren't. It wasn't a great period, but they, it, they're featuring so big in England in in lots of ways. Even some of the town names are derived from you know Viking uh, language, and so it was a it was an obvious next step for me. But I was thinking at the time, actually, you could go around the world and and all of the religions and all of the cultures have got their dark side. There's always a devil and, a, you know, and there's always like a, a a God side of it. So you can you could have gone through any of the cultures and and I was that's what I was planning to do. So tear was me then starting to experiment with things. One of them was vocal harmonies. Now, Black Sabbath is not known for vocal harmonies. Do you know what I mean? There's only one singer. And on like Anno Mundi, for example, where I've done that Gregorian chant thing, <laughs> there's like 50 voices on there. Well, they haven't got 50 singers. So, you know, we, then you have to sort of think, how else are you going to reproduce like, this thing? We did it, of course, with samples and Jeff Nichols uh, uh, helped with all of yeah. that. But um, you could see how it, it had come from say um well if we actually jeff nichols yeah so from heaven and hell where he'd started to introduce some keyboard pad sounds but then you know by the time we got to headless cross jeff nichols was you know featuring quite heavily with strings and um sort of sounds back then and then too we were really you know pushing the boat out and and experimenting with stuff but it still sounded like black sabbath yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the, the, underneath was all of that stuff, but over the top was still very much Tony Iommi. You know, so we weren't doing anything that we weren't allowed to do, um, and we weren't doing anything that really took us away from the the underlying Sabbath thing. 
it, it was experimental, but it was like it, it, it was still working. Now, Forbidden was the only one that sort of came down short, I thought. Um, but, you know, this is the way with Black Sabbath. Uh, it's always been a band that has changed and morphed into different things. And it's like people say, which is your favorite James Bond? Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. you know you got, it's, it's like Iron Maiden. Favorite. Iron Maiden's the same way, too. There's such a legacy yeah. that everybody has their own era that they love. They right? do. Or, um, and um, same with that, you know, which is your favorite Black, sing Black Sabbath singer? Well, there's lots to choose from, <laughs> you know. Let me ask you, uh, Ronnie James Dio, when he first joined Black Sabbath, you know, he got the poster saying, Ozzy, Ozzy, we want Ozzy back. But I mean, he was an incredible singer and he had an incredible history with Black Sabbath. Yeah, There's yeah. always that backlash. Did you get a lot of backlash and people saying, you know, we want this guy back or that guy back? No, I, I didn't um, get too much of that. Um, uh, mostly wherever we went, uh, they were very welcoming and the, they kind of, I think they were just sitting there waiting, you know, find out what I was going to do and who I was. Cause nobody really heard of me before. So, um, you know, it was kind of, what's this <laughs> sort of thing, you know? Um, of course, then you still get, you know, the, uh, people with who think that, uh, uh, Dio is the best or uh, Ozzy is the best. That's fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with any of that. Um, you know, I'm very aware of those eras and, uh, you know, I, had, I sang all of those songs in the shows that we used to do. So uh, very respectful of what they did. Um, in fact, I tried to tell Ronnie that once. <laughs> You've probably heard that story when I met Dio. I it's think the you did. only yeah, yeah, meeting. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> Ronnie, just wanted to say you're a hard act to follow, man. He said, good. And walked off. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, what I find uh, like one of your stories is, is when you guys were in Russia, a lot of people don't even, even today, they don't realize Black Sabbath was one of the first bands to actually play. Not one, yeah. not, not the only, but one of the first. Yeah. Heavy metal, at least. Tell me about you're in Russia. Like, I mean, they're talking about like the are in current Russia here. We're not talking about yeah. today's Russia. No, it was still very well, Soviet when we were there. Were you were you scared? I, was everybody worried about the equipment being stolen, getting hurt? Or? Yeah, a little. And I think they wanted to pay us in tractors <laughs> or something like that instead of money. Um, but uh, it was weird. Um, and yes, you're right, a little bit scary. But you, we were getting on, you know, all right back then. Um, it, it was it was difficult but it, it wasn't impossible and everybody was trying you know they were trying you know uh, to welcome us and we were trying to be there in that but they just didn't have um they didn't quite know how concerts worked or were really put together um and so <laughs> some of the things that happened were really odd really really odd i mean in um moscow the the front row of the audience was like uh, 40 feet away from the front of the stages and in between the stage and the front row was like the army and the police and water cannons and God knows what else. Um, and the front row was always like the dignitaries, like you'd get the mayor and the mayor's wife, the mayor's mother-in-law, <laughs> grandma, the kids, you know, all of that sort of thing across the front row. And uh, I only poked me in the ribs one, one of the shows and said, look at that down there. And, and grandma was knitting <laughs> to Iron Man. Oh, God. And bottles it's were flying, right? They were tossing bottles and they were tossing stuff. Yeah, into... they were doing all sorts of stuff. So it was very weird being there. Um, what were the accommodations the... like when you walked into your, your rooms? So and... basic. So basic. I mean, we had, I don't know if you, if you remember the, the landscape of Moscow, everybody's seen it. It's been on the TV. And there's that wedding cake building that they always show. And it, it starts off wider at the bottom and gradually gets taller and taller until you get to the narrow bit at the top. And it looks like a bell tower on the top. Well, yeah. my, my room was right at the top, just underneath that tower. And it was a huge room. It had hardly any furnishings in it at all. It had a bed. It had a piano. And it had a fridge. Well, the fridge was turned on, but there was nothing in it. It was just empty. <laughs> well, I think was expecting maybe that we take our own or something. I don't know. <laughs> it just Did they give you it. like rations? Here are your rations back then. Yeah, but, yeah, honestly, we didn't have. Uh, mostly, all they were serving uh, then was 
like caviar, <laughs> Russian vodka, champagne, and re- all of the bread was seemed to be dried and curling up at the corners. You know, ah, oh, it was so basic, really basic. Were, were the fans like starving for music? Did they know yes. the songs, or did they just go there because this is a they show? They were a bit confused. Uh, they were a bit confused. Um, I think they were told to go. <laughs> Some of them were told to go. You know. But like, especially why would grandma be there knitting, you know? But um, uh, yeah, it, it was weird. It was just were, were people brilliant. singing along to any? Like, did you notice? Like, again, we're not talking about like the front row, which is all dignitaries, but yeah. we're talking about the audience themselves. Were they the, the, there because a, to experience a, a concert or to see Black Sabbath? A lot of them. They, uh, you know, they did know the um, the band, and Ozzy had been out there before us, I think. Um, who else had been out? I can't remember who else had been out there, but there was Billy Joel, maybe I don't know. something like that, uh, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah. But um, so yeah, there was an element of the uh, the audience that did know of the band, um, and they tried to sing the words, but obviously some were English was all right, and some weren't. But um, back then, you know, we were getting on all right, and it, it was it, it was uh, we were happy to be engaged. You know, and, and happy to be part of it. And I've I've been to Russia and Ukraine, and they're all fine people, but it's just all messed up now and, and very different. We can't do that now, so uh, it's a shame. But yeah, at the time we were doing all right. Has been any? Have you been working on you know a band going out and playing the songs from this box set, or maybe with Tony Iommi renaming the band, not Heaven and Hell, but maybe the Eternal Idol? And is there any talks about? getting these songs played live, performing live. Now, we've, uh, as far as I'm aware, mm-hmm. um, I was told that um, Tony's really done with touring now. And um, yeah. and so that's not likely to happen. I did sort of say, you know, if they were interested, if they wanted to do something, I'd, I'd be happy to give it a go. Um, we'd have to wait and see if he's up there. And he hasn't stopped working. I mean, he's still doing stuff. Um. But like I was told anyway, that his touring days were done. Um, So I don't think so. I mean, I could probably get out on the road and do things myself. Um, It's it's slightly harder for me because I I have to start at the beginning. My career went into the studio uh, writing and recording. So for the past 25 years, I've been doing that, you know, and and it's been good for me. You know, I've, I've been happy in the studio, but that means you don't have a band then. So. You know, I'd have to start from scratch and hire the musicians and all that stuff. I don't have a Tony Martin band. So, you know, there's you, lots you know, of possibilities. You, all right, cool. I remember I remember now going back 15 years, maybe you kind of like metal was not really where it is today. Right. Or yeah. hard rock. And you kind of gave up and a lot of people kind of gave up. You know, like, what's the point? We're running around, you know, just running around everywhere. No one's being very helpful. There's not the enthusiasm from the fans, the promoters. It's changed now though, right? Yeah. Do you think maybe Tony Martin, you know, doing festivals and with, I know that before COVID you were putting together a band or you're trying to. Yeah. I was, I was trying to get it out there. COVID did interrupt. Um, And then people went off and started doing other things. So we kind of lost contact and the the momentum sort of stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most fatal things, you know, once the momentum stops, then you, you have to start all over again, <laughs> you know, and it, it is uh, tiring, but you have to find out who's willing to do what. And so now you're right. Now people are starting to talk about things again. And, and so maybe it, uh, things will start to move and, and, and possibly get things together. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm actually, you know, thinking forward. I'm not thinking backwards. So, um, I, I had that Thorns album out a couple of years ago, which was interrupted by the COVID thing, and we didn't finish that. We were supposed to get a, a vinyl thing out, which we have to write some new tracks for. Other things happened, and then the box set thing came up, and it, it just got <laughs> distractions from all all over the place. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to you know getting things together and rolling again. So uh, okay. let's see how it goes. All right, sure. Um, is there anything you want to talk about in regards to the box set that you want to tell everybody, you know, uh, Hey, everyone, here's your pitch. You know, (laughs) what do you want to tell everybody about this box set that, you know, maybe people misunderstood over the years or 
I know there's a new generation. There's a new generation. There is, yeah, there a is brand new generation. There is, and um, we're reaching out to everybody now, really. Um, whilst it's on people's minds, um, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm helping out promote it, because I'm not part of the band anymore. Uh, but they said, would you help to promote it? I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's, it's my history as well as the band's history. So I'm more than happy to help out, you know, doing this kind of thing. But we're reaching out to, like, everybody now, the people that we didn't reach before, uh, the fans that have been waiting just as long as I have <laughs> and you have to sort of get their hands on this stuff. Um, and to just reintroduce it, you know, to people who maybe weren't sure about it, come back and have a listen. Because, you know, honestly, when I spoke to Tony Iommi and he was just thrilled with it and he's given it a great validation now, you know, you know the way he talks about it now is much, you know, he's more fond of it now than he ever has been, I think, um, which has brought us closer together. Uh, but it's just a great thing, and, and it looks really cool. You know, they've done a great job putting it together. Um, it's not in a, a limited edition, so, you know, it, it'll be available for some time yet. Um, as I understand it, the first run sold out on day one you know but so they're frantically trying to get a new you know uh run issued you know to catch up with like the demand so that all speaks good um i'm just pleased for everybody you know I, i'm pleased for the fans i'm i'm pleased for us in, in the band um I, I just wish it well i really do because uh, i think it deserves to be out well there. i'll give you my plug i've heard it the remasters sound really good you know, they really bring out each instrument and they sound really good. It's well worth the wait. And the remix is excellent. It's because sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, so people revisit the albums and they remix things. And sometimes it doesn't sound better than what that was before. But this genuinely does. You know, they've done a, a great job. on it. I've never asked you this. Have you ever been in touch with Ozzy over the years? No, um, it's one one thing that I've never felt the urge to, to do. Um, I've, I've worked with everybody practically that Ozzy's worked with. And it's almost like I know him already, you know, from my ex-manager that, that used to go to school with Ozzy and his first jobs and stuff. So I know all of that. In the Horn they, Factory. They In the Horn Factory, that's where Ozzy worked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you never met him? To, you never met him? No, no. And um, my, I feel like I have. I feel like I have. I mean, my manager, they went to school together and then they worked in an abattoir, believe it or not. And the stories from that is just incredibly funny. But um, yeah, um, I feel like I know him already. And obviously I've been singing his songs over the years uh, and happy to do that. You know, it, it's uh, uh, I'm very respectful of that era. You know, it, I first saw Sabbath when I was 15. And um, what was they doing? Uh, Masters of Reality. Masters that's what they were reality. doing. Wow, look at that. And so yeah. um, that's when I was first introduced. So, you know, I've got great respect for it. I, I, I love it. I do. So, you do, know. do you ever think you're in the audience, you're watching Ozzy perform, you go, hmm, I'd like to be there. Or did you ever even cross your I, mind that you'd be like the singer? Of that, that is really weird because, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 15, absolutely. You know, because we all wanted to be famous. And in our hometowns, when you're young in your hometown, there's a venue that usually is the place where the big, big bands play. And you sort of say to yourself, right, if I ever get to play that venue, you know you've become famous because that's where all the big bands play. And here um, in Birmingham in England, there was there's a place called the Odeon in the city center yeah, and, yeah. and we all said you know if you ever get to play the Odeon you know you've made it big well I went to see Sabbath there at the Odeon and then when I joined Black Sabbath I ended up playing at the Odeon so it was like wow I'm actually standing on the same stage as you know those when and I'm looking out to the crowd where I used to sit as a kid really it, weird it, it's really unheard of for an well I don't want to insult you but like an unknown singer right yeah to be in such a big band, it was, it was, yeah. there are a few exceptions here and there. Brian Johnson, I think he was pretty much unknown when yeah. he joined ACDC, 
But I mean, I think that's a credit to your voice or your vocal abilities. Yes, and I owe everything to Black Sabbath. I mean, it, it, the people of around the world would never have heard my voice if they if I hadn't have been in Black Sabbath. So you know, I owe everything to that. Um, and um, what an honor to have been part of the story. You know, yeah, just yeah. even a small part of the story. You know, it's been um, a great ride. I, I, I haven't got many uh, regrets. I mean. Perhaps uh, I wish I'd have allowed myself to enjoy it more. I was so busy trying to, you know, do it right that I forgot to enjoy it. You know, so I look back on it now and I can smile a lot. You know, it, it's got great memories now. It's interesting because all the we'll call them replacement singers. They all went sort of what you went through. Like you're scared yeah. to maybe give too much of your opinion because you're the new guy, right? You wanna you wanna right, please right. everyone, right? And and you don't want to. You don't want to ruin anything, and you just sort yeah. of like you're you're sort of following in a sense. Yeah. But and you're very not much. enjoying it. You're not enjoying yes. it as much as you should. Yeah, very much so. And and be, because they got that you know amount of history and experience before you, um, you don't know all of the stories and the the ins and outs of the stuff. So you know, in the beginning, you have to sit there and listen, and you know pick up as much as you can and and then uh, run with it you know it's a it's a weird thing you're constantly reading between the lines and uh that in itself can sap your energy you know when you're you, you're trying to do your job but you're also listening out for like what well, what was that what's going on so <laughs> it's really it, it's really an deal. awkward like it's a big machine the name black sabbath is big it's huge you know, it, it's huge and and being the new guy, I mean, I you know when I talked to Blaze Bailey, you know, in a sense, I felt the same way. Like, you kind of want to give input, but at the same time, you don't want to yeah. give too much input, right? And, 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 and I think that's the same with any job. You yeah, know, it, it, it doesn't is. matter what career you're in. Yeah. If you're the new guy, you're the new you guy. Know, you, you, you're gonna have to learn, and you're gonna have to sort of gather as much information as you can. So. I, it's like Tony Iommi said to me recently, he said, we probably expected too much of you really, you know, to just jump in and, and just take over, you know, completely. Um, he said, you, you, you did really good. Oh, thanks, man. So he, he does get it and he does understand. Um, but it was it was hard work, really, really genuinely <laughs> fucking hard work. You, you see, see, uh, see, Dio comes in, but metal was exploding at the time. So he's right. He's sort of sort of with the crowd right you know he's right, doing but he's the, music done the rainbow thing already as as well yes and he had that yeah. credibility and and here you're coming when metal's like diminishing yeah. every year more and more and that's even harder to do you know and they can't blame it on your voice it is yeah. you know because you have to try and keep up with the well you don't have to keep up with the trends i mean i i only told me told me a story recently that um along the way you know people had asked him to change his style to fit the thing of the day and he's yeah. no no i can't i just can't i'm you know i'm tony iomi and this is the way i play and 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 this is you know where it's got to be um and and forbidden proves that you know when you try to change something that's so established you know that, well i that's mean the proof you, know, you, need. You, you guys get into the sunset strip with uh rusty angels right rusty angels now we're talking about wait a second is this a band from the sunset strip or is this black sabbath no it's hair was, metal it was no Rusty Angels is about in was it Arizona where there's a massive place where they put aeroplanes um when they're finished the thing and they put them there either for spares um or and they just sort of sit and rust away. Um once they were angels in the sky and then they're, now they're rusting. So it was Rusty Angels, it was all about that thing uh, no no I guess I should have been more clear. The sound and the, the musical oh. stylings not the lyrical content, but the musical right stylings, like, you know what, this could have been right on the whiskey, you know, Sunset Strip. This is the sound of sort of the era, well, of the 80s yeah. or the late 80s, yeah. And we, and we were, you know, be, because we were with um, Ice-T and the Body Count guys, we were, you know, trying. We were trying, you know, to sort of give it a go. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, not long before that, they'd had that run DMC thing with Aerosmith. Yeah. You, you know, gotta, so we'd be going, eh, possibly. 
<laughs> it's tough. <laughs> it's tough, right? Like you're the, the trend is going one way, record sales is going another way, and you're kind of yeah. like torn, like maybe we should change. I know, and, and everybody does it. It happened way back, I don't know if you remember, when punk rock came in the end of the 70s into the early 80s, and everybody went, what the hell is that, you know, sort of thing. Is this really the future of music, you know? And, uh, but I think the music business needs, you know, these young bands and these new I things agree. coming in yeah. To, yeah. to give it a lift. Uh, yep, to, yep. to to shake things up a little bit so we were listening and we do you do understand what it's there why it's there well but, you know what i'll leave you with this i'm i know i know domini in the year of our lord it's going to be released may 31st on rhino yep. and bmg in uk and europe uh you know what i'm really happy for you i'm happy for the fans that this has finally come to fruition uh, not not a better person or better singer or artist to have this closure. I mean, finally, you're getting what everybody wanted. Um, yeah. Congratulations. Everybody go pick it up. Uh, it's worth it. I've heard it. It sounds fabulous. Thank you. All right. Any, any closing notes? I think we've done it. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony. I don't want to take uh, any more of your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cheers, buddy. Thank you.